The 2019 FIDE World Cup rolls on, as do our videos here on Chess.com's YouTube, Twitch, and every other video platform channel. We are now in round three in Conti Monsisk, and to start things off with a bang, Alexander Grishuk had a very, very interesting game today when he played the Blacks pieces against Xu Shangyu, who uh, is actually well known for playing for the Shangdu Pandas, one of the Pro Chess League teams, basically Team China that competes in the Pro Chess League. They made it all the way to the Final Four last year. So uh, interesting battle that we wanted to review for you here on our YouTube and other channels, and let's dive in. So uh, to start out, we had another D4 game, and with a main line occurring here, transposing via a Nimzu Indian move order right into a more traditional Queen's Gambit decline type position. And uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of instructive breakdown of what happens in the Rogozin structure, which is defined as when the bishop is developed to b4 versus more standard squares like e7, as you see in Queen Pawn games. Uh, when the bishop is on e7, it often serves a bigger picture purpose, whereas you look at the bishop on b4 and say, how is that always not better? It's more active. It pins the knight to the king here, right? And uh, most of the time, we would always define our pieces as being better when they have more squares and more options and exert more pressure. But what ends up happening in a Rogozin with a bishop on b4 is this bishop is often a target. Um, and the fact that the bishop on e7 may seem less passive optically, it actually helps defend your knight, who's one of the key players in terms of holding down the center, supporting d5, supporting e4. So this is just a little bit of advice in regards to thinking about the bigger picture about where your pieces go. Um, the Rogozin is very, very popular theory at high levels right now because it is so dynamic. But this, the theory that happens in this game and the way the players place their pieces is going to kind of circle around what ends up happening in regards to the storyline of this bishop here. Does it does it ultimately do something very aggressive or does it retreat and how, why, and what uh, happens after that? So um, the main move queen a4 check is designed specifically to take advantage of the bishop on b4, which is why I stopped and tried to explain some of that. Because by giving this check, you're literally forcing the move knight to c6 to defend the bishop. Uh, why is that important? Well, in any queen's pawn game, in fact, it's very much a Russian schoolboy sort of rule that whenever you have a queen's pawn game, which is defined as the lead pawn in the center is the queen pawn. To be clear, queen's pawn game doesn't have to be d4 on move one. It does. It could be knight f3, c4, it could be anything, right? But it's defined as which pawn is the lead pawn in the center of these two pawns, of the, the king and queen pawns. Well, when the queen pawn is the lead pawn, and that means this pawn will often go here to support it, we define those as a queen's pawn game. And in a queen's pawn game, typically you don't want to block your c pawn on either side. We see white hasn't done that. White has gotten the knight out behind the c pawn to help exert pressure. Often this pawn will end up wanting to go to squares like c6, where it supports things like the pawn on d5. Sometimes the pawn wants to have the option of playing for c5. Uh, so another reason not to put a knight in front of it. So the queen a4 check theory in the Rogozin that forces knight c6 is, is one positional move, meaning queen a4 is very much a positional move to take advantage of black's previous move. So when you look at these openings from now on, maybe you'll have a little bit more knowledge of, of why this line is played. White is trying to punish black by saying, yes, you have a more active bishop, but now you've got some dysfunction. Your knight is blocking your c-pawn, and that pawn is normally serving bigger purposes in the center. So the game continues with e3, and after castle is very natural, we get the queen back to c2. This is already not the most common theoretical move. Um, spend some time analyzing it, along with Grandmaster Dan Boykov, who does Chess.com's news report game of the day stuff. You can check out my blog. I know I owe you guys a link for the last blog when I did Hikaru's Lost to Nisa PNU and uh, Nihal Sarin's game. It's coming. Just been a busy weekend. Um, but I'll have a link to the blog on Chess.com for this game as well. And I, I did my own analysis, and then Dayon kind of backed it up to say that bishop d2, dc4, bishop c4, this is actually the main line. Uh, one of the things that happens in this line when black retreats the bishop is you're wasting a time. You're wasting tempi, excuse me, wasting time, wasting a tempi. But you're trying to play for e5 now to change the structure, to justify the knight being in front of the c-pawn. You go for e5 and, and change the, change the game, so to speak. So that's the main line. But queen to c2 is a very useful move saying, you know what, my queen served the purpose here on a4 of forcing your knight to come to c6 and she's no longer needed i'm not going to sit here and wait for my queen to feel out of place or, or to get attacked maybe by a bishop to d7 so we voluntarily retreat her this is this is kind of a modern way that white plays these positions 
The disadvantage of that is exactly what Grishnik does here to punish it. He plays b6. He's saying, well, if your queen is no longer going to be attacking my knight, then I'm going to play b6 so that I can complete my development. I'd much rather have my bishop on this long diagonal than on a square like d7. So each one of these is like kind of heavyweight fighters sort of shuffling a little bit of footwork to get the middle game they want. After b6, bishop d2, bishop b7 makes sense that at some point the tension here is going to break. We get a3, and of course we retreat the bishop. When the bishop isn't going to be serving the purpose of maybe doubling the c-pawns, right? If uh, if you're taking and, and making them take back this way with a pawn, um, or even taking with the queen, where you might lose a tempo to something like knight e4. If these things are happening, that's one thing. But otherwise, it almost always makes sense that we keep the bishop on this diagonal, and that's what black does often in these Rogozins. So here we see the move C takes D5. Now I analyzed and uh, looks like Dayon actually, who I only merged his analysis recently, didn't even look at it because this video comes from my, my analysis and my work, I promise. Um, Bishop to D3 is actually the main line theory. He didn't really make any notes about that. It, it's not um, so critical. The, one of the games you'll find after D C4, Bishop C4 is actually the move A6. Um, I analyzed, I think that probably the the more aggressive way for black to play is actually to move the knight to a5 immediately with tempo and try for c5. This might be something that uh, we see black go for in future games. Either way, white was not interested in losing time with this bishop and allowing black to change the structure. So instead, he forces the issue by closing the center taking on d5. Black takes back with the pawn because taking with the knight would allow white to get the two big pawns in the center. So the drawback is you take with the pawn, which cramps your bishop. And then we get the move bishop b3, a6, which controls the b5 square from knight b5. Knight to e2, knight to e7, and here we've got our first kind of critical moment. Um, note that both knights are sort of relocating themselves to the king side where they anticipate the action will be going down. I also analyze that a move here possible is the move knight to b8 to come to d7. Um, you can actually change the move or around if you want by playing queen e7 first and then the move knight to b8 to try to come to d7. This is a different plan for black that is all about supporting c5 as a way to kind of break through in the center. It's, it's going to be a different game. Um, white can do a number of things in this position, including b4. Uh, knight to g3 to threaten knight f5 is one thing that sometimes irritates this, this queen and bishop setup, and rook, rook f or a to c1. So uh, Grishuk wanted something else. He played the move knight e7, and I, I, I wondered... And reviewing this, if if Sasha was still in in preparation, um, possibly not. There not, aren't a lot of games in this line, but I think that you could argue he probably was in preparation in terms of his feel and his understanding, um, and that really gets uh, shown here after the next move, which is really where we are already get into some really really sharp stuff, where the tempo starts to be controlled by one player, and he kind of never lets go of it. I really don't like the move that uh, Shu Shangyu played here, which is Bishop to C three. This is a move that's trying to anticipate the change of the structure. So on that level, it makes sense. The bishop coming to c3 is saying, I'm going to make c5 hard for you. If you ever play c5, I trade and open up my bishop. Right? So from a, from a strategic level, it's, a, it's almost a prophylactic move. But I think the biggest issue is that it doesn't challenge the other very direct plane black has. And this bishop just feels um, like it wasted time. It wasted time to come here. And um, if the structure doesn't change to give it the life that it wants, I don't know that white ever has a chance for a slight edge again. Um, I analyzed that I think knight to g3, just a more standard move. Also b4 is sometimes possible in these positions. You always have to watch out for the shots happening anyway, uh, a5 and c5. But I think either one of those moves is, is more strategically wise. After bishop c3, Grishuk takes his opportunity to say, forget about the c5 plan we've been highlighting a lot and we know black wants to do in a lot of queen's pawn games, and I'm going to play the move knight to e4. Um, I, I think already at this point, black is forcing the win of the bishop here. The, the bishop on c3 can be traded, and if um, we'll, we'll analyze the line that I did. Let's say that white doesn't play the move that he did in the game. Bishop takes here. Let's say he castles. Probably the biggest issue is that at some point, black will just trade and have the bishop pair and now can play for a long-term plan of c5 where any sort of opening of the dark squares in the center eventually become good for black, right? Because when you have a bishop that your opponent doesn't, you want to open up lines on those particular color complex. Um, the other opportunity is to play the move knight to g6, which I analyzed. Looks like Dayan was also suggesting g6 is possible in some positions. Idea of relocating. And by the way, g6, of course, does defend bishop takes h7 check. Um, but I think that the big issue there is white might have the move e4, which changes the structure and might actually allow me to win my bishop pair back. So knight to g6, 
Uh, threatening to bring the knight into the king side makes a lot of sense. Um, if you do nothing here, if you play a more standard move, you might even see knight h4. And now all of a sudden we're actually bringing the heat over here to the king side, trying to rid this knight from f3 and, and the chances that maybe something real nasty happens over here. Um, and if you try to play e4 now, you're opening up the f4 square for a knight. So uh, variations like taking here and something like knight f4 are possible. I even looked at one fun line where if you keep taking, white takes, black takes here in Ermizo first. The knight is hanging, and so is uh, the, the king, really, because you can't take the bishop back due to queen g5 and Bob's your uncle on g2 over there. So that was a fun line I analyzed just to show some of the dynamic potential that black maybe has in this position with the two bishops if they can come to life. So those are probably variations that uh, Shang Yu didn't want to go for when he took on e4 to give up the light score bishop. The problem is after takes in knight g5, if he went for this thinking he was winning a pawn, Sasha had other things in order, and he was not about to show mercy. He plays the move knight to d5. I love this move. It, it, it comes to life, laughs in the face of danger of the e-pawn falling, and says, if you're opening the position, only one of us is going to really benefit from that, buddy. My bishops are about to come to life. White takes e4. Frankly, there's not really anything else you can do here. Um, the knight is hanging due to the queen. And um, you, you played it to bring the knight and take e4, so you might as well. But now queen h4 is played, and we immediately see that white is in big trouble here. So uh, what are some lines that show that? One very fun one is if you try to defend the knight's position. In the, in the game, white tucked his tail between his leg and the pony ran home. But if you try to defend that knight's position, we have a very, very nice tactic. You can pause your video. Three, two, one. Okay, no more. Knight takes e3. Exclam. You, you take and open up the pin so that bishop takes e4 is just crushing. Obviously, taking with the queen here would lose the lady. We take on g3 with check and then win the queen on e4. So the best move is probably queen f2. And I think black has pleasant choices of just retreating the bishop and having a very good position with two of them. Or if you want, you could probably trade by force into an endgame where you win the g2 pawn and only black can win. So that that wasn't ideal. Um, no other no other moves to defend the knight are really possible. Um, you can retreat to other squares, but you're running into similar issues where e3 is hanging because the pawn is pinned to the king and black is just crushing. So in the game, knight 4 to g3 was played, but that allows black to win the bishop pair fully, take on g2 with tempo, and then play the move bishop of 3, stopping white from ever having the chance of castling long. And already, white is completely under the gun here. The rest of the moves here are completely forced, and in the end... Uh, you, you're going to want to stick around because there may have been a moment where Sasha did show mercy and this game may or may not have had a chance to go completely the other way. It gets really fun from here. But just to highlight the strategic way that Black outplayed his opponent to this point in the Ragozin is really interesting, right? The, the way the bishop retreats from d6 to start, the way the bishops aligned together with this plan of 94, exposing just that one small mistake where the bishop kind of went to c3. If you just look at this position here and realize how much better Black is, which Black was, it's really hard not to just love the way that uh, Grisha played this game. Now, that said, because white is just in big trouble here, I can't get my king out of the center, right? H2's falling. If I do nothing, my king's only going to get in more trouble when these pieces come. I have to go for the most forcing line on the board, whether it works or not. And he does so with the move knight f5, which is a fork town on the queen and the pawn on g7. But the problem is it's really just a bunch of... Uh, bunch of smoke and mirrors because when you take with check and the king moves only you are the are are really in trouble when things like queen h1 check are coming right about to say like only you have the power or something but this isn't captain planet right so king h8 comes uh there's a threat of queen h1 which means that white is in big trouble um and so white has to be all in plays the move knight e4 uh precisely because the one last chance black or white might have is that if you go queen h1 and try to get too greedy Things like knight f6 come in in the end, and uh, you may have trouble dealing with checkmates on h7. Um, things like queen h1 might even run into knight d6 instead of winning the queen, where I'm, I'm really forcing my way through a checkmate. For, remember that h7 square. That may come back to, uh, to haunt you if you're playing black. So knight e4 is, is trying all hopes that you can, but black should be winning here with best play. Uh, bishop h5 has played a very good move that's trying to relocate the bishop to guard h7 and do some nastiness over here. Um, I analyzed, and it looks like Dayon agreed with me, that maybe rook g8 was a simpler approach for Grisha to get rid of these checkmate ideas and renew threats like queen h1. If things like take g8 happen and then king to d2 uh, to try to run the king out because of this terribly devastating threat, the rook can come up to g6, 
guarding things, and probably white is still in big trouble. Note that this knight can never move without undefending the pawn on f2. So just, just going to be a very, very dangerous position for white. Instead, after knight e4, Grishik plays bishop h5, still good, even if rook g8 might have been safer. But knight f6, bishop g6, guarding everything. The biggest issue is that in order to come back and guard this, you finally relinquished your control over this diagonal, which means white is going to get out of dodge when he has the chance, gets the king castled. And it's in this moment right here that, uh, that everything really, really should have gone downhill for white, but this is when the, the mines are blown, right? So you played super well as black. Maybe rook g8 was better, but you should be able to put this one away because guess what? This rook is trapped, and the moment you eliminate the knight, I'm going to win the rook, right? So it seems like it should be straightforward. Problem is, black plays bishop e7. And if we want to pause your video to see exactly what kind of amazing combination that white did have here to save the game, you can. Um, spoiler alert, Zhang Yu didn't find it. The move was rook takes h7, double x clam, just going right forward despite the fact that black has a million defenders because in the end of this line whether you take with the king or the queen on h7 white's playing queen e4 and there's no way to stop rook h1 and it's not just that white's winning back material the queen for two rooks it's that this king is going to get mated with the queen and knight batman and robin the dynamic duo are going to do work over there so this is this is an amazing position because i was analyzing this um and, and kind of had the engine running in the background while making notes. And all of a sudden, in this position, it's it's what black is completely winning. It's minus plus. And all of a sudden, bishop e7 is played. And I just do like a triple take over to the engine. I'm like, what? There was a win here? And just, uh, it was it was pretty fun. I was actually in a team call uh, with our content team and, and paused what I was doing to talk about the game. So um, how black could have won? He could have played the move queen h3. Uh this is, this is a more simple move that, as we were talking about, as soon as this knight falls, the rook falls, and queen h3 is kind of the easiest thing that says, hey, how are you dealing with the knight, right? Um, and then the rook falls. Uh, note, of course, that you can't take right away, I guess I should have mentioned that, and then play something like king to g7, because among other things, there's going to be crazy ideas where, I guess, h7 can even fall, and you can go for ideas like this. Um and of course, you could sack your queen, but here white might take and get a whole lot of checks. And uh, the other ideas are probably involving queen h, queen to g5 and rook to g1, which threaten mate on g7. And uh, actually, this this is going to be the most accurate way that white could have won. I had a bunch of lines, but we'll show that one. So, so that's why you can't just take and take g7 right away. Should clarify that. But queen h3 would have done the job. You overwhelm the knight. Eventually, this guy's going to hang. And note now that taking h7 doesn't do the trick anymore because when the queen takes and you come up to e4, we have rook e8 with tempo. The queen moves and we have bishop h2. Rather than the bishop being on e7, the bishop can come to h2 to block the rook from coming to the h file. Uh, key defensive point, black starts to get active, threatens rook g1, which will simplify everything, get everybody traded. Black will be fine. And um, this is the big difference, is that just the subtle the subtle retreat of this bishop was actually a double question mark moved by Grishuk that unfortunately for Xiong Yu, he missed the chance to take advantage on h7 now, played the move queen c6, and Sasha never looked back. He now takes on f5. The point is that rook d to g1, while it threatens these g-file mates, it's not enough. Bishop g6 can block everything. White was forced to sacrifice through and ultimately settle on the end game where he has a queen for a bunch of pieces. But we're going to see a really good example of technique and emphasizing one thing I always tell my students, uh, which is the coordination and the ability to both deliver and stop threats is always much more important than your dogmatic point values. People lose these games as black because they try to hold on to everybody, the two rooks and the bishop. The moment you emphasize coordination, getting your pieces in their ideal spot, even at the cost of giving back a little bit of material because you have so much of it, is the is the the moment you start converting these games every time in your own chess. So let's watch how black does that. Puts the bishop on a protected square, quickly centralizes both rooks, and even though white in the meantime, is able to threaten a big pawn center to win back material. Grishik has no issues with this. King g7, the bishop can't be taken now because the pawn's pinned, but c5 proves the point. He's willing to eventually lose this bishop, which he's going to by force, gives back gives back the bishop for checks and takes d5, and here Xiong Yu just resigns. I'll admit this is, this is a slightly premature resignation, but just to make it really clear why this is just over, uh, Let's say queen takes a6. The human approach, maybe the engines have something better, I don't care. But the reason this is over on a human level, I'll, I'll even do this one, is the rooks are going to come to the point where they're connected and protected. Let me say that again. 
They're connected and protected. At that moment, not only are there tons of threats, but the G pawn is just going to march up the board and there's nothing the queen can do to stop it, right? So when, when you have a position where the rooks are fully coordinated and they can just get behind a pass pawn, another way to do it might even be to, to think about this rook coming to f5 and the other rook coming to g6 behind it. And again, with no, with no way to dislodge the rooks, they're protecting each other and stopping checks. The queen is just a helpless bystander while the g pawn runs. So, a little bit, a little bit premature, I admit. I, I think he was probably frustrated. Who knows? Maybe he even suddenly realized that he actually missed a win back here on bishop e7. I don't know. And that uh, it could have been the the moment that uh, Sasha Grishuk uh, snatched and swallowed defeat from the jaws of victory with this move bishop e7. Again, would have been a very, very tough finish for for the man from Russia. But as it stands, Xiang Yu does not find this. Grishik has won the first game here in his round three matchup versus the Chinese player. And uh, we're going to see where this one takes us from here. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Hope you're appreciating the, the World Cup coverage that we're bringing you. And I will see you around on Chess.com.